Hi, everyone, and welcome to our third installment of IPS Shutdown Teachings. Thank you so much for logging in and you know, viewing this online. Um, the title of my presentation today is The Regulatory State is Shut Down. Long live the deregulatory state. Um, in a way, the title is self-explanatory. Uh, which is one of the aspects of the long federal shutdown that isn't talked about enough is how it is being used as a cover for deregulation and also how it illustrates the warped priorities of our government. The fact that deregulation in the interests of business is treated as a governmental priority while real human needs of real people are treated as expendable governmental functions that can be suspended indefinitely. Before I launch into more details, I, I do want to make one point very clear. I am by no means making the argument that this is the real reason to be concerned about the shutdown. Rather, I'm saying that this is one of many aspects of the shutdown that we should be concerned about, uh, and it isn't getting enough attention. But we must also be very clear that the shutdown has been motivated by racism, pure and simple. Uh, the fact that the U.S. government wants to further militarize our already heavily militarized border with Mexico, a country that I should remind listeners is not a country we are, you know, uh, at war with or have any open hostilities with. Um, and so really there is no legitimate excuse for militarizing this border to begin with. And still we have this unreasonable demand for further militarization of the border, uh, leading to a shutdown in government. And that governmental shutdown has had very real impacts on very real people. Uh, on a lot of federal workers and contractors, and especially where I live, you know, where IPS is located, here in the greater Washington DC area where we have a lot of federal employees. And also I would like to remind people that federal workers are not all you know, high level white collar workers in um, top agencies. They're not all suits, so to speak. Uh, many federal employees are, um, you know, employees and contractors especially are, you know, cafeteria workers and janitors and people like that who live paycheck to paycheck anyway and have been really hard hit by this shutdown. And so I want you to keep all of this in mind as I talk about this other relatively ignored aspect of the shutdown. Uh, just to be clear that I'm not making the argument that what I will be talking about is the only reason or the real reason or even the most important reason to be concerned about the shutdown. Okay, with that background, <coughs> sorry, technical difficulties here. Yes. Oh. So as most of you are aware, uh, there are some governmental agencies that are open during the shutdown. For instance, uh, Medicare and Medicaid, though um, new applicants will have longer wait times and that does pose a lot of hardship. Um, the post office, veterans healthcare, uh, air traffic control and um, airport security. Though a lot of those workers are not being paid, they are being uh, forced to work for free, which is pretty outrageous. But still, you know, those are governmental functions that are operating. But there are some very important governmental functions that are shut down. 
One of them is a lot of Food and Drug Administration food inspections. Not all of them, they're still in inspecting seafood and infant formula, which they consider to be particularly high risk. And the US Department of Agriculture has their own inspection programs for um, uh, meat and uh, poultry, uh, which are still functional. Uh, but a lot of the FDA food safety inspections for produce, for example, uh, are not functional. And that is obviously a public health risk. Likewise, uh, our national parks are shut down. Uh, and some of them were for a period open to visitors, leading to, among other things, accumulation of trash and no one to clean up the trash. Uh, and even when they are shut down, it shows what priorities where uh, the federal government does not regard, you know, the upkeep of uh, uh, biodiversity and, uh, uh, you know, reserved natural areas as being a high priority. Likewise, um, a lot of EPA uh, pollution monitoring programs have been shut down. And one particularly egregious example I want to highlight, uh, the Great Lakes region has been hit with a wave of toxic algae blooms, which is like a triple whammy, a confluence of uh, three different um, harmful environmental impacts. Number one, there's a lot of runoff of phosphate fertilizer from our um, uh, overly dependent on chemicals agricultural system, or very unsustainable, unjust food system. Uh, and uh, this accumulation of phosphate fertilizers causes what is called eutrophication excess nutrient in water that leads to a buildup of algae, some of which are toxic, and makes water undrinkable. And remember that a lot of uh, Great Lake cities depend on the fresh water of the Great Lakes as a source of drinking water. So this is very harmful for the ecosystems and for biodiversity and also for people. Um, and that's combined with two different climate change effects. Number one, as waters warm, uh, these toxic algae can form blooms more easily. And number three, uh, heavier rainfall, again attributable to climate change, leads to more runoff, therefore more phosphate fertilizer building up in the Great Lakes. Uh, so with this triple whammy of unsustainable agriculture, warming waters and heavier rainfall, we are seeing a real buildup of toxic algae in the Great Lakes. And uh, the EPA had this agreement with local jurisdictions in the Great Lakes area and with the Canadian government uh, to monitor and enforce water quality standards for the Great Lakes. And that has fallen to the cracks posing huge risks to a lot of people who depend on the water. And it also shows how internationally the US government uh, is an unreliable partner. Uh, they make international commitments and then they promptly violate them because of uh, messed up internal politics here in the US. Uh, so the Canadian government essentially negotiated an agreement with an unreliable partner who you know, cannot be counted on to keep their word. OK, here's another outrageous thing. Um, Long-term disaster recovery for um, Hurricane Florence, for example, uh, has been shut down. And Here's an example of uh, disproportionately poor people, people of color, dealing with outrageous impacts from this 
so-called natural disaster, which is in many ways an unnatural disaster, uh, greatly exacerbated by climate change, uh, and a disaster that led to, among other things, um, I'm sorry, this is gross, but it has to be talked about, um, uh, raw manure from huge pig farming operations getting into the water supply across the state of North Carolina. Uh, and uh, this unprecedented destruction, uh, you know, the, the FEMA response, the kind of immediate band-aid response to the disaster, that is still going on. But the long-term recovery, which is funded through HUD, through Housing and Urban Development, has been shut down. And so people in North Carolina who did nothing to cause this crisis and are you know, paying for it every day in terms of uh, terrible living conditions uh, are being told to wait because of this political fight in Washington over something as unreasonable as a racist border war. Uh, think about this as you think about the shutdown. So what's in common between all these areas of government I've talked about which are impacted by the shutdown? They're all regulatory functions in the sense that they entail government uh, making and enforcing rules and regulations that govern the conduct of business a lot of times uh, for the benefit of the environment, for the benefit of public health, uh, for the benefit of uh, community safety, etc. And they particularly benefit vulnerable people. And if they are carried out effectively and honestly and sincerely, they could have an impact on corporate profits. They could actually limit corporate power and corporate profits, right? Uh, if the federal government really tells companies that no, you cannot cut corners on safety, you cannot uh, you know, discharge this pollutant untreated into the water to save your costs, etc. Okay, however, there are areas of the government that are not shut down. One of them, interestingly, is oil and gas drilling permits on public lands. So while the government does not prioritize struggling communities in North Carolina or by the shores of the Great Lakes, uh, poor people in, you know, places like Cleveland who cannot afford bottled water, you know, communities of color in North Carolina who are disproportionately impact, impacted by events like Hurricane Florence. Um, the interests of the oil and gas industry are considered high priority governmental functions. And therefore, the Department of the Interior is still issuing oil and gas drilling permits. One little silver lining is that a federal court in South Carolina has um, uh, put a moratorium on offshore drilling permits during the shutdown uh, in response to a, you know, to a lawsuit brought by a, a coastal protection uh, nonprofit in South Carolina. Okay. Here's another thing that's happening even while the government is shut down. The really controversial proposal to open up the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge to oil drilling, um, which has been something the oil and gas industry has been trying to do for the last more than 15 years. There's actually a rulemaking on it going ahead in the Department of the Interior, even as the government is shut down. And I would like to point out that this is an example of finding yourself in a hole and digging deeper. The reason that 
more of the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge is accessible to oil billing today has to do with climate change. It has to do with the fact that a lot of the ice has melted. A lot of the ice is, you know, uh, more seasonal. And even where there is ice, it's, you know, it's present for a shorter duration. And so there's a longer drilling season. Uh, temperatures are higher, so it's easier to drill for oil there. And so the same fossil fuel industry whose emissions have created these warming temperatures is now trying to take advantage of the warmer temperatures to drill for more oil. And that's about the most backwards thinking logic you can think of. And yet it's going ahead at the Department of the Interior. And here's a really outrageous thing. So um, a whistleblower, a, a federal whistleblower organization called Public Employees for Environmental Responsibility, here for short, uh, has issued a complaint with the GAO, the Government Accountability Office, that apparently the Department of the Interior has called back furloughed employees with the specific purpose of um, oil and gas drilling permits. So um, this, is, this is a violation of the laws governing the shutdown, the Anti-Deficiency Act, which says that uh, governmental functions defined as uh, non-essential should not, you know, should not occur without specific funding appropriated by Congress to do so. And the fact that they are willing to bend the rules even during this government shutdown to serve the interests of the oil and gas industry, it, it's really stunning. So again, what does this show? What is in common between these specific governmental operations that are still open for business in more senses than one? Uh, literally, yes, but also open for the purpose of serving business interests. They are all deregulatory functions. They're all functions that entail cutting back the power of government over corporations. They all benefit corporations. In the particular examples I pointed out, uh, largely fossil fuel industry, but there could be and are examples from other areas as well. And they actually are harmful to large sections of the public. They hurt the environment, they hurt public health and safety, and they have a disproportionate effect <laughs> on the most vulnerable sections of the population, those who are most exposed to these hazards. And it clearly shows you whose interests the federal government works in and doesn't work in. Let me, you know, before I move on to the next slide, let me point out one kind of overarching observation. None of this is unique to the shutdown. None of this is unique to even the present administration. It is longstanding policy in Washington. Uh, it is, um, you know, it is symptomatic of the warped priorities of a government that prioritizes the profits and the gain of a few over the needs of most people. And that is precisely the point. So here's a quote from um, someone many of you have probably heard of, someone named Grover Norquist, uh, not to be confused with a certain Sesame Street puppet. Um, he's a corporate puppet, not a Sesame Street puppet. Uh, <laughs> and he said, I don't want to abolish government. 
I simply want to reduce it to the size where I can drag it into the bathroom and drown it in the bathtub. This is not even a statement he made in private off the record that somehow got leaked. People like this. Uh, he, he heads an organization called Americans for Tax Reform, which is uh, uh, this far right anti government organization that uh, advocates the shrinking of government in the public interest. They say, therefore, the shrinking of government. That's not entirely true, and I will come to that in a minute. Uh, they support shrinking government in the public interest, not government as a whole. Uh, and these people talk openly about their hostility to the idea of a democratic government that's actually accountable to the government has gone the opposite way and said that these people, you know, vulnerable families with young children uh, trying to flee horrific violence and trying to flee um, uh, droughts and climate change and destruction and poverty are somehow a threat to the safety of Americans. Oh, <clears throat> Uh, Basim, will you be ready for questions in a minute? Um, let me just deal with while we're clicking. One more quick. Oh yeah, please. Yes. <laughs> so, guess what else is still open for business? Number one, the military. Number two, the you could call them a paramilitary agency, the border patrol. Uh, and other arms of federal law enforcement, like you know, the FBI, the Drug Enforcement Administration, the ATF, etc. So why are these agencies open? You could say it's national security needs. You know that's what the official explanation would be. But could it be that the state wants its coercive arms? you know, those parts of the state which can <clears throat> compel people to do certain things using armed force or the threat of armed force, uh, that somehow the state wants those parts of itself to be open and functioning, even while those parts of the state that benefit most of us, you know, benefit regular people are shut down, right? Because if, for instance, the shutdown leads to um, massive domestic dissent. You have these coercive arms of the government ready to crack down on the dissent, right? This might sound, the whole thing might sound like a conspiracy theory, but it doesn't have to be. I absolutely don't believe that the government, you know, got, or, you know, top government officials, you know, sat behind closed doors and said, let's shut down the government so we can do these deregulatory things. But the point is, it doesn't have to be a conspiracy. Decades of neoliberalism, decades of this ideology that government, or at least government that benefits people and regulation of big corporations is bad has become this form of bipartisan common sense, almost like a state religion in Washington. And uh, everything I said flows from that ideology. And so while right-wing interests didn't create the shutdown, I can assure you they are you know, quite ready to and already are taking advantage of it. And this is exactly what Naomi Klein refers to as the shock doctrine, right? And um, this is the classic methodology of privatization, which is something else we need to be vigilant about, which is that you set up governmental institutions to fail and then point at their failure to say that, see, government doesn't work, and therefore let's sell it off to private corporations who can do the job better. This is the shock doctrine playbook, you know? It's classic. And I think with that, I'm ready for questions. You know, I have more things to talk about that I 
could get to if there aren't enough questions, but hey, I'm ready for questions. We have a handful of questions here. Mm -hmm. Easier to just sit here so you don't have to flip the thing back and forth, or plus you don't have to put me on camera at all. Uh, yeah, wherever you want to. All right. Um, sit here to your side, boss up. We have a handful of questions that have come in um, before the event and during. Mm -hmm. um, here's a fun one. Uh, what lessons can be learned from effective national mobilization efforts such as World War II to get American citizens as well as global citizens of developed nations to get past their polarization, unfreeze their denial, and act now like our very lives depend on it to make drastic changes to save our common home for generations to come? Uh, this question comes from Burke who's identified as the college son of Alaska's last active snowshoe craftsman. <laughs> okay. I hear this question and my memory flashes back to, oh dear, I'm getting old. Almost 20 years ago, November 30th, 1999, okay? Massive demonstration in Seattle shuts down the meeting of the World Trade Organization, mm -hmm. right? Um, a lot of observers here in North America, you know, the usual uh, chattering so-called pundit class, look at it and go, where did this come from? Mm -hmm. My response as someone who's grown up in the global south is, wow, at long last. At long last, people in the north are starting to get what we in the global south have known about and lived with for decades, that the so-called global economy is completely rigged. The so-called global economy is a mechanism to benefit large, largely northern corporations uh, at the expense of most people in the world, people in the South as well as in the North. And the reason this uh, realization came late to North America and to the North and to wealthy countries in general is that finally in the 1990s, this unjust global economic order started to affect people here. And uh, when it started to, for instance, affect people's job security, uh, when they realized that uh, large corporations had captured their government and were actually starting to hurt their interests, that's when they started to pay attention. And I would argue that that process is already underway when it comes to climate change. Um, just yesterday, I read the news that uh, the percentage of Americans today who say that climate change is actively hurting them right now stands at 48%, which is you know, nearly half the population. And a much larger section of the population believes that climate change is something the government should prioritize addressing. So even if they don't necessarily see it hurting them right now, they do realize it is something that has the potential to hurt them in the near future. And I would attribute that to the fact that there have been such major climate disasters here in the North, uh, you know, uh, Hurricanes Harvey and Maria year before last, uh, Florence last year, uh, there was one more in Florida, why can't I remember it, Michael. Uh, Florence and Michael last year, then the devastating wildfires in California, etc. So now that climate change is devastating lives, uh, both through major disasters like that and through, you know, creeping things like uh, the drought that seems, the chronic drought that seems to affect half of this country, uh, or extreme heat waves like the ones that hit Europe last year. Um, 
now that climate change has started to really, in a tangible way, affect large numbers of people in the North, uh, that realization and that, you know, that impetus for change is inevitably going to come. Great. So we are just a shade over time because we have some technical hiccups. I think maybe we can go a little bit longer uh, if you're still available, Basa. Uh, I have at least three or four more questions that we would maybe like to knock out in the next 10 minutes or so. Mm -hmm. um, related to some of those disasters you were just discussing is this, um, is the way that it's kind of um, put our political system up to much greater scrutiny and um, including this like very classic scheme that you described very well in your last slide. And so this question is, you talked a lot about the classic privatization methodology, which is say setting up public agencies to fail and then using that as an excuse to privatize them. Um, can you talk a little bit about how this played out recently in Puerto Rico, which is one of the places of separate disasters mm -hmm. that you just mentioned, mm -hmm. uh, or even further back in Flint? Absolutely. Uh, so in Puerto Rico, there's a crisis within a crisis within a crisis, or as Naomi Klein calls it, the shock after shock after shock after. Mm -hmm. um, so to start with, uh, Puerto Rico's status is essentially a colony. Uh, Puerto Rico has no sovereignty and self-determination to speak of. Mm -hmm. Doesn't have representation in Congress, cannot vote for president, uh, etc. And um, and it's still held by the United States. And large numbers of people in the U.S. don't even know that Puerto Rico is U.S. territory. And you know, uh, racist anti-immigrant people have you know uh, uh, verbally attacked Puerto Ricans for being here. Not that they should attack anyone for being here, but it's doubly ironic that they're attacking Puerto Ricans who uh, even within our messed up immigration system do have a right to be here. Even on the floor of the house. Yes, mm -hmm. yes, mm -hmm. yes. Um, so um, number one, Puerto Rico is a common. Number two, um, Puerto Rico's so-called debt owed to Wall Street uh, uh, investment banks and hedge funds and so on, is a classic case of what is termed odious debt. Many people in Puerto Rico will point out that, yes, legitimately, there was governmental corruption. There was no reason for the government of Puerto Rico to have borrowed so much money. And there is evidence that some of that money was misused. That does not make the debt legitimate. That does not mean that the debt should be repaid. If anything, just the reverse. Regular people in Puerto Rico, like you know, uh, teachers and students and you know, uh, people who depend on needed government services, are being made to pay. They're being made to pay the price for a debt that they did not have any voice in contracting in the first place. And this has happened in the interna international arena as well. You know, you think about uh, the debts that Indonesia still owes uh, to international banks, including the World Bank and the IMF, for uh, loans taken out by the extremely corrupt crony capitalist Suharto administration. Uh, same thing can be said about um, Congo's debt attributable to the Mobutu dictatorship uh, or South Africa's debt dating back to apartheid times, etc. All of these are what you could call odious debt, and Puerto Rico's debt is odious debt. And in spite of that, uh, the government set up this um, essentially control board to oversee Puerto Rico's finances, to make sure that Wall Street banks got repaid, never mind the price paid by Puerto Ricans, and imposed this horrific set of austerity measures on Puerto Rico, right? Uh, which is, you know, classic, I don't want to go into too much details here, but it's classic IMF and World Bank imposed structural adjustment all over again. Um, 
And one of the results of, um, of this uh, austerity is that the electric grid in Puerto Rico was very poorly maintained, right? Uh, because it was underinvested in as a consequence of austerity. And so when Hurricane Maria hit, uh, the grid got devastated. And that devastation and the slowness of the response in restoring the electric grid, which is partly attributable to the fact that it was poorly maintained in the first place, and partly attributable to the fact that uh, the government, whether it's the federal government or the government of Puerto Rico, did not prioritize restoring the grid, uh, especially for vulnerable people in rural and isolated parts of the island. Um, and so that failure to restore the grid, you know, the fact that uh, access to electricity fell to Global South levels in uh, a territory of one of the richest countries in the world, uh, that's being used as an excuse to now privatize Puerto Rico's electric grid, which of course doesn't address the core problem, which is lack of investment. If anything, it makes it worse because a private entity is quite likely to prioritize cost saving and to cut corners uh, and to not prioritize, you know, uh, customers who are in remote and rural areas. Uh, so, so that is how this privatization playbook uh, applies to Puerto Rico, or one example of how it applies to Puerto Rico. It's also playing out in, in the school system as well. I, mean, I don't want to get into too much details here. And likewise, um, while to my knowledge, the crisis in Flint has not led to actual calls for privatization. It is still a classic example of how public resources and public services <laughs> like water supply, electricity, transportation, etc., get systematically underinvested in, under maintained, and run down. Uh, you know, the fact that uh, Flint and Washington DC and uh, you know many other cities uh, across the country still have um, aging lead pipes. Mm -hmm. That's just outrageous. That's just completely outrageous. And somehow a country that uh, finds the money to um, uh, uh, threaten to bomb Venezuela, for example, or like, threaten to intervene in Venezuela to change its regime, or a country that you know has been actively arming the Saudi Arabians to perpetrate horrific injustices in Yemen, somehow doesn't find the money to replace lead water pipes that affect vulnerable people right here at home. And that is completely outrageous. Thank you, Bata. Uh, we're about at the end of our time here, but we have a few questions that are sort of geared towards uh, stuff that can be done. But um, because we're at the end, I'm going to divide them elegantly into a three-part question. <laughs> um, you mentioned earlier on uh, a lawsuit in North Carolina regarding offshore drilling. Uh, is That's there, South Carolina. Oh, South Carolina, thank you. Is there any broader movement to halt drilling permits while the shutdown goes on? That's the first part of the question. Uh, second part of the question is concerned what kind of powers Congress has uh, that it either has or is likely to exercise um, when it comes to Trump's climate deregulations during the shutdown and probably more generally. Um, and then the third question is more at the, the movement level. Um, the shutdown is affecting nearly, as, nearly every aspect of our lives negatively. Do you have ideas about how different advocacy organizations and movements can work across issues to really make a lot of noise about how they intersect even after the shutdown ends? So is anything interesting happening on those drilling permits that you talked about? Uh, is there anything that might get done in Congress? Um, and you have great ideas about how movements can keep the momentum up on this even after the shutdown ends. Great. So with the first question, um, this isn't only about the shutdown. There is actually, you know, uh, 
there are lawsuits as well as other forms of intervention where all kinds of organizations are fighting the entire um, energy dominance agenda. Uh, for instance, the Keystone XL pipeline that it's slated to transport um, Canadian tar sands oil to export terminals uh, is essentially paralyzed by a lawsuit. Uh, likewise, the push to um, uh, essentially destroy these uh, national monuments in Utah, uh, the um, Bears Ears National Monument, which is actually sacred land to Native American people who live there. Uh, so much for an administration that claims that they are for freedom of religion. Clearly, it's freedom of religion for some people. <laughs> but anyway, um, there are Native nations who are suing to block the giveaway of their years. And similarly, there's this, and, and that giveaway is to the oil and gas industry, really. It's you know, opening it up for uh, uh, mineral rights. Uh, and likewise, there's this lawsuit in South Carolina, which just had this uh, little victory. And so everywhere that the administration is trying to roll out its energy dominance agenda, there is a pushback at every level, you know, from uh, uh, state utility commissions to courts to, um, uh, I also mentioned the GAO complaint that this whistleblower group has uh, made uh, to actual, you know, movement politics like uh, uh, demonstrations, etc. So, so, so every element of this agenda is contested, and that is what has really slowed it down. I will, I will point out just one more example, which is uh, uh, part of what I called the um, grow the captive market prong of the energy dominance agenda. So the Department of Energy came up with this madcap scheme, I don't know how else to describe it, to force all of us, you and I, to subsidize the coal and nuclear industries through our electricity bills uh, by claiming that uh, during, you know, during an emergency like you know, uh, a major snowstorm, uh, those are more resilient forms of power generation because they have fuel on site. And um, so this scheme was shut down by the uh, Federal Energy Regulatory Commission uh, by FERC. And so this is yet another example of where the energy dominance agenda, sinister though it is, is actually meeting a lot of barriers, okay? Now on to Congress. There is a lot that Congress can do in terms of oversight. Uh, the deep corruption in a lot of federal agencies uh, can actually be probed. Uh, for instance, um, the uh, acting head of the EPA whose uh, nomination is evidently going through the Senate right now, uh, Wheeler, uh, the acting head of Interior, a um, guy called Barnard, uh, and uh, many other political appointees in both those departments and in the Energy Department are these corrupt industry operatives who are, you know, openly misusing their power in the administration to uh, advance the interests of the, the very industries they're supposed to regulate. And Congress can conduct oversight hearings and you know expose these corrupt players for who they are and um, really embarrass the administration, force a lot of resignations, and you know create a lot of scandals that deserve to be scandals. Uh, and that's that's a great thing that Congress can do, even where we have a situation where. Uh, the Senate will likely not advance any meaningful or good legislation. And honestly, a lot of the uh, Democratic leadership in the House are not ready to take up really visionary good legislation on climate and environment. Uh, and of course, the president will be doing anything good. Uh, so, so even in that environment, there's a lot that the House can do 
or certain house committees can do in terms of oversight of our uh, corrupt government. Uh, and finally, the last question, the movement question, can, can you repeat that for a minute? Absolutely. Um, because the shutdown is impacting nearly every aspect of people's lives, the question is, I wonder if you have ideas about how different advocacy organizations can work across issues and really make a lot of noise about how they intersect with each other even after the shutdown ends. That is a beautiful question. Um, and the shortest answer I can provide is that there has been an imperfect but regardless growing sense of developing a movement of movements where all our you know different movements whether it's uh, environmental movement racial justice movement economic justice and workers rights movement and you can you know divide those into you know uh, housing justice and tenants rights or healthcare rights or you know there are many such intersecting movements or you know lgbtq movement gender justice movement you know movements for sovereignty of indigenous peoples you know uh, all of those movements even though silos do still exist and there are sometimes setbacks and there are you know good reasons sometimes for there being mutual mistrust uh, but there has been a slow evolution where uh, the movements really are coming together for instance you know just given my personal experience in the environment in there are things that are just not acceptable today that would have been, you know, par for the course um, 20 years ago, for instance. Uh, let's talk about the border wall. Uh, I can imagine how a couple of decades back, uh, environmental groups may have been very concerned about the impacts on biodiversity and on ecosystems and on water uh, in in the desert because of the, they should be concerned about those things but today it is just not acceptable for environmental groups to be talking publicly about those things without also acknowledging that the border wall is a massive human rights violation of very vulnerable people um, migrants certainly but also um, uh, native nations in arizona whose territory the wall the proposed wall is going to cut through uh, so um so there has been a slow evolution and i can only hope that that evolution will continue during the shutdown as people start incorporating into their analysis different elements of the shutdown. The fact that it was prompted by racism, the fact that it constitutes a massive assault on the rights of workers, uh, federal workers who are left without a paycheck and sometimes being forced to work for free, which is completely outrageous. And number three, that the shutdown is being used as cover for ramping up of this very sinister deregulatory agenda. Well, thank you, Basa. We've covered an awful lot of ground today. I want to thank everyone who's watched and sent questions, uh, and particularly folks who stuck with us as we uh, patched together a couple different feeds. We will be mashing all of these different feeds into one video so you can view it at your convenience later on. But for everyone who's here right now, thank you so much for joining us. We turn ideas into action. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye.